Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, which is India's first future tech meets sustainability podcast. And today I'm delighted and honored to have with me Dr. Nishant Chakravarti, who is a faculty member at the School of Medical Science and Technology, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. He leads the Regenerative Medicine Lab at SMST. His research and work areas are human pathophysiological conditions with an attempt to identify clinically relevant translational solutions using the principles of regenerative medicine. His research interests include diseases like beta thalassemia, osteoporosis, and osteoarthritis. He is the author of Regenerative Medicines, Emerging Techniques to Translational Approaches. And the topic of discussion today is going to be obviously regenerative medicine and biotech. So, Doctor, really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. Some seven years back, I'd seen this TED talk by Ricardo Sabatini titled How to Read the Genome and Build a Human Being. And I, I, when I saw that uh, the TED talk, I was really blown, you know, because it during the course of the talk, he brings this uh, like I think 130 odd books. And it's it's the the genome of uh, Dr. Craig Venter, the pioneer of, of DNA. Would be great if you could start with kind of explaining what DNA versus RNA is. Is it the source code of life? And would you refer to it as the programming code of biological beings? Hi, Eri. Firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, TED uh, this talk. Uh, and the TED talk that you are referring to is definitely one of the most interesting points to start with. So as uh, you rightly struck the chord at the very beginning uh, to talk about the genetic code. Now, let me begin with an anecdote which I often use when we talk about regenerative medicine or genetics uh, in general. So like we are communicating in the English language which has 26 alphabets in it. And we make so many permutations and combinations with these uh, different letters. And then we produce our sounds, which then join together to form sentences. And then we are speaking. And again, we have different tones of speaking. What is very interesting about this genetic code is that it has only four letters in it. So as I think most of us know, the DNA has four nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. In contrast to this, RNA has, uh, instead of thymine, it has uracil. So of course, uh, this is elementary uh, biology, uh, but then uh, once you move ahead uh, and read a bit more, then you again understand that there are certain differences as well. So you it may be possible to have uracil containing DNA. So let's not get into that at this stage, but yes, uh, what we see as DNA, uh, of course, it is not visible to the normal naked eye, uh, but uh, from our understanding based on the literature, it's a double helical structure, which has these uh, different nucleotides joining together. Uh, and uh, as per the findings, it is seen that one of these, for example, adenine will always bind to thymine, whereas cytosine will always bind to guanine. So this is again a universal law, which again, uh, it is very difficult to break if you may even think of doing it. In contrast to this, as I said, in case of RNA, you have instead of thymine, you have uracil. So it remains the same, A will bind with U and C will bind with G. The other major difference is, of course, uh, in terms of the sugar. So here in DNA, you have the deoxyribose sugar, whereas in case of RNA, you have the ribose sugar. And of course, DNA is a double helical structure, whereas RNA is a single strand of RNA that we usually see. And of course, there are certain modifications, like for example, the tRNA has a different kind of an arrangement. So, but broadly speaking, yes, it's a single strand, uh, which again is very important to note because most of the diagnostic techniques that we think about, for example, uh, during the COVID days, we were hearing a lot about uh, sequencing, and we were also hearing about PCRs, so polymerase chain reaction. What exactly happens over there is uh, our body has this genetic code uh, ingrained in all the different cells of our body. Uh, similarly, any living organism or any, any organism which has a genetic code, like for example, the COVID virus, that also has a genetic code. It's an RNA virus. So if you see, as I mentioned, it's a single standard RNA first, but 
if you want to look at whether somebody has that virus, you would like to look at the RNA content because that is different. The code is different from what we have in our human body. It's a sequence of arrangement of the letters that is present, which is unique to that particular virus as compared to all the other uh, sequences that we have within our body. How do you do that? Is if you are able to amplify it, because these are again, very small minuscule amounts that are present. So you cannot visualize them or you cannot observe them with our conventional systems. So the first thing that needs to be done is to amplify it. And uh, the way this polymerase chain reaction works is uh, since the DNA is double stranded, so once you break the strands of the DNA, it becomes two. And then you can again recreate the complementary strands. That technology has already been developed. So what happens is with every cycle, you are basically doubling the number of uh, DNA strands that you're getting, the DNA um, coils that you're getting. So <laughs> in case of RNA, if you just want to do that, it's a single strand. So every time you have only one that is increasing. So the amplification will be very slower compared to in case of DNA. So what we do is first we convert this RNA to a DNA and then we move about it. So coming back to your uh, question or uh, uh, the discussion that you started with, um, maybe uh, what you can probably, I think the question that you might have is, is it possible to recreate an entire human being? Uh, uh, is that the question? Am I right? Well, well, yeah, yeah, sort of. Maybe, but, but, but yes, I, I think. I mean, maybe obviously that is the that is something which was extremely fascinating, and maybe we can delve onto it possibly later because that's like I mean, maybe possibly giving uh, too much in, yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in the beginning. So, so maybe what what we could do is you know maybe also kind of elaborate because there's three point two billion base pairs of D D DNA. Could you elaborate the potential implications and applications of mastering this language of understanding this four base pairs A G C and T? Absolutely. I mean, so if you see um, our body has these chromosomes. So DNA is not just like in case of a bacteria, the DNA is just present like a blob of uh, DNA which is present. Whereas in uh, all eukaryotic organisms, which are the relatively highly developed organisms, including humans, of course, humans are much more complex. So there the DNA is organized in these chromosome-like structures within each. So uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, we have, uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes, what we say, right? Like 22 uh, autosomes and uh, two of the sex chromosomes that are present. And within each of them, we have the DNA coil within it. And interestingly, the, what matters is not only the coiling of the, uh, the presence of this architecture of the DNA in terms of the arrangement of the letters, but the way the DNA is also coiled, which essentially means that there are certain proteins within which the DNA is coiled. So there are certain molecules called histones. So uh, the arrangement of the DNA coils on these histone proteins also has a great role to play. And which means that, you know, I mean, when we talk about this code, basically we are looking at how we use this language to create proteins. The central dogma, which is talked about, includes that DNA will get converted to RNA and then that will have the code to write the proteins. So the idea here is that uh, now, as you can imagine, these are very like, we cannot see the uh, even the cell, uh, maybe some cells we can see by the naked eye, but most cells are much more microscopic in nature, right? So we certainly will not be able to see the chromosomes as well, but these are packed with, as you rightly said, 3.2 billion base pairs. So how does the uh, body or how does the genetic code recognize which area to uh, unfold and create a protein, whereas which not to. So there comes the role of these histone-like proteins and many other modifications. So whenever we, for example, talk about, uh, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, what do you call, the genes that are getting coded and which are not getting coded. So you, we tend to ignore some of the epigenetic modifications. Now I'm bringing in a term, I'm sorry. Uh, but epigenetics is something which is, again, like genetics, which is, again, inheritable, like it gets passed on generations after generations, but it is not the genetic code. It is not the sequence of letters. Instead, these are certain modifications. For example, I was talking about these proteins like histones. So histone proteins 
on which these uh, uh, DNA is coiled. So that will allow either it to become much concise and small, where probably it will be very difficult for it to get unfolded and uh, create the protein. Whereas the loose uh, spaces where they are much uh, uh, like further apart, those can be coded in a much easier fashion. So uh, definitely, the, uh, if we are talking about 3.2 billion base pairs, the interesting thing is that uh, we have around 20, uh, now I think around 30,000 genes have been recognized. So you can imagine the difference. So 3.2 billion base pairs, in contrast to that, only 30,000 uh, genes are getting expressed. So majority of the portion of the DNA that we have is essentially, uh, there's a lot of debate around it, but we call it as junk DNA which means that it uh, we are not, as of now, very sure about the role of these uh, molecules. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I think there is something so awesome going out, you know, in, in the in the universe that we live in because we, we made made out of atoms and, and here we are, we understand possibly the 5% of the entire matter that's there and that there's black matter and black energy that we don't know nothing about and the same energy stands true with DNA. You know, there's so much that we know and there's so much that we don't know of that we call, you know, possibly junk DNA. Uh, now, so, so you explain DNA and RNA in genetics versus epigenetics, the environment kind of affecting uh, the genes. Uh, can you also explain, you only alluded to it, you know, maybe explain the concept of genetic editing and, and tools such as CRISPR, you know, and how do you see these CRISPR-Cas9 playing a role in revolutionizing healthcare? Oh, very interesting question. So uh, over the, I mean, over if you look at the sequence of uh, things happening, so people started, uh, I think, with, uh, we were looking for, scientists were looking for how we can edit the genome or edit certain portions of the gene. So people started uh, initially when the HIV virus was discovered, it, it was causing and it still causes uh, disease. Whereas uh, in addition to causing disease, one of the phenomena which caught the attention of scientists was that this kind of virus can integrate with the genome. Many viruses can integrate with the genome. What does that mean? So these viral particles are, uh, I mean, it's still not clear whether we will consider them to be the most primitive form of life or the most advanced form of life. Why? Because uh, these cannot by themselves uh, replicate, which means they cannot form their own uh, uh, pro product by themselves. They require the, another uh, cell to propagate itself. That means that once these viruses get into the cell, they will hijack the genetic machinery of that particular cell and gets in many of them get integrated with the genes of or genetic material of that cell and once now at that point of time the cell starts feeling that this is my own genetic code so let me replicate this as well and while doing that it starts producing viral proteins as well so lentiviruses have this interesting property as well uh, which I'm talking about, for example, the HIV virus. So uh, that is how this uh, lentiviral transfections we call were started with. So uh, I think one of the initial uh, discoveries was that uh, we probably will be able to use them for uh, a disease called SCID, severe combined immune deficiency syndrome in, uh, in kids. So obviously when you're using lentiviral particles, uh, people really will get... Uh, struck with the fact that uh, this is, we are talking about the HIV virus. So obviously uh, we are not using it per se directly like the virus itself. What we are doing is we are using a replication deficient virus, which means that uh, we are removing certain parts of the virus so that it cannot form the HIV virus by itself. Only what we can do is we cut certain portions of this uh, uh, gene and then we edit and we are able to incorporate a another gene of, of, of our interest and then we put it back. So this was, I think, one of the earlier things. Then people came up with talons, uh, zinc finger nucleases, and now people have come up with this CRISPR-Cas technology. How was this discovered? Essentially in case of bacteria. Now, bacteria, we know that this is a very primitive form of life. And we were not very sure uh, even till recently that how probably they can, uh, I mean, do they have any mechanism to 
prevent any kind of disease to themselves, to bacteria. But some viruses can infect bacteria, that is also known. So how does uh, the bacteria prevent it? So CRISPR is a technology within these uh, bacteria where they can recognize the non uh, or the foreign uh, genetic material with that. So they have a particular sequence which can, it's like the immune system of the bacteria. So it can recognize the foreign system and then they can create another material which can cut that uh, particle, that uh, genetic material. So, and as a result, that virus will not be able to propagate. So we have now adapted this technology into humans as well, whereby if you want to remove a part of a particular gene within the human uh, cells, or maybe somehow add it, so you have to cut it using, you just introduce a part of that gene and with a particular protein called Cas9, and there are other variants of this Cas protein as well. So you put that, and then it will be able to cut that particular gene, which is defective. And what you can do is you can introduce a normal variant of that gene, which can be synthesized in the lab, and then you put it that, and it can be glued together. Right, right. So, so through this CRISPR Cas9 gene editing method, where you can, or maybe edit out or add a specific gene, what could be the implication? You know, the potential in the health healthcare. You know, what what what's what's being done right now, and what do you see happening in 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 the next few years with with this tool? Uh, CRISPR Cas9. Enormous implications. Uh, in fact, uh, very recently, um, FDA has actually approved the first uh, drug, which is, uh, I think the commercial name is Cascavi, uh, which is, uh, I think it's uh, the actual name is uh, uh, exagamaglogene autotem cell. So, what the, this is being used for, or this is being thought to be used for uh, diseases, hematopoietic, uh, or hematological diseases, including uh, sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia. To explain this, let me just delve a bit about this disease, these two diseases essentially. Uh, so, you might have heard about anemia, right? Now, anemia. It's best not to call it as a disease, but it's more like a symptom of a disease or uh, more better to call it as a sign because only other people can recognize that if they see that they're you're looking pale and maybe having anemia. So most common cause is a nutritional deficiency, which includes iron deficiency anemia. But there are other types of anemias as well, uh, like genetic uh, factors or genetic causes. <clears throat> uh, most prominent among them include sickle cell anemia. So, and then we have this beta thalassemia. So, to understand this better, let me go back further to explain what hemoglobin is. <clears throat> so we have uh, known that uh, our body requires oxygen and then it takes out the carbon dioxide. Uh, so each cell and tissue is doing this process while metabolizing food. So in that process, what is done is uh, you need this carrier of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So blood with its red blood cells has this um, protein, it's a metalloprotein essentially, which can carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. So hemoglobin, as I said, has two components. One is the metal, which is the iron component, and then you have globin proteins. So you have <clears throat> four proteins, and within which you have the central region is the uh, iron content. So iron, there are, iron can form multiple coordination bonds. So amongst that, two bonds are left to form, to join with oxygen molecules. So uh, the globin is essentially a protein, which means that it is going to be derived from the uh, genes. Now, even within the globin protein, you have two components, two types essentially. Uh, and we have named them uh, like alpha, beta, and so on and so forth. Uh, the one which is most predominant in our body is the adult type of hemoglobin, which is more than 95%. It contains two alpha chains and two beta chains. Uh, there are other forms of hemoglobin as well, which comprise in that 5% or less than 5%. So in normal adults, uh, postnatal life, uh, like after around four to six weeks or maybe after three months of life, this adult uh, hemoglobin is the most predominant form. So what happens if one of the chains, which I was referring to as the beta chain, is having a problem. Basically, an abnormal mutation is present. So mutation is essentially 
the sequence of letters which is normally present somewhere there is a problem so and that is uh, because it is being transmitted uh, heritably so it is a disease which is having a genetic inheritance as well so obviously the causes are multiple so i'm not going to that so when we talk about sickle cell disease there is a known mutation which can cause this disease. There's only one particular region in the uh, beta globin gene which has this uh, mutation. In contrast to this, the other disease, beta thalassemia, it has more than, I think, uh, as of now, more than 300 mutations are known. So at different sites. So some patient may have a mutation in one particular region, another patient will have a mutation in another region, or some part, some patients will have a big deletion, a big portion getting deleted. So as I was referring to you uh, about the other types of hemoglobins, uh, now within that less than 5%, we have one form of hemoglobin known as fetal hemoglobin. And why the name fetal hemoglobin? Is because this is the most predominant form when uh, the uh, uh, baby is in, in, inside the womb. Uh, it's in utero form. <clears throat> so uh, this fetal hemoglobin then changes over to the adult hemoglobin. Now fetal hemoglobin has alpha 2 chains and uh, this gamma 2 chains. So two alpha chains and two gamma chains. But uh, this has a much higher affinity to oxygen <clears throat> compared to the adult hemoglobin. So what happens is because in, when it, the baby is inside the mother's womb, obviously the size is small. So it has to, it can serve the purpose that it can extract the oxygen from the mother's blood and then give it to the cells and tissues, which is a small, obviously, surface area, small body. But in order to function in the adult body, you need a type of hemoglobin which can take blood easily, take oxygen easily, and then also release it easily. Fetal hemoglobin cannot release the oxygen relatively less easily compared to the uh, adult hemoglobin form. So that is possibly the reason, uh, again, we don't know what nature's reasons are, but as per our understanding, that possibly is the reason why nature has devised it such that once the baby is born, within the next four to six weeks or maybe up to three months, this type of hemoglobin goes down, the fetal hemoglobin will go down and the adult hemoglobin takes over. Unfortunately, in these patients of sickle cell and beta thalassemia, because of the mutation, they will not be able to function properly. And hence, you get to see this anemia. So uh, coming back to CASGEVI or this uh, CRISPR-Cas technology, uh, the company has come up with a technology where they will be able to possibly reactivate this fetal hemoglobin form. And as we can understand, it is a physiologically normal form, which was suppressed by different mechanisms. Uh, so there are multiple genes and proteins which have been identified. Uh, amongst them, uh, they have identified some particular proteins um, which are known as transcription factors. So they will be able to activate that and hence they will be able to activate the fetal hemoglobin form. And as a result of which, although the adult form is not functioning properly, yet this uh, fetal hemoglobin form kicks in and it can start functioning. Now, I also mentioned that the, there is an inherent problem with the fetal hemoglobin that it cannot release the oxygen as easily as compared to the adult. Yet, uh, we do see people uh, with certain condition known as hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin. These people are physiologically normal. So although we think that they might be having a problem, but it's not really the case. So in that possible way, I think it may be uh, possible for people, uh, again, with a higher level of fetal hemoglobin, to uh, have a much normal life compared to uh, having a diseased uh, adult hemoglobin. So this was a recent breakthrough, uh, which uh, got uh, uh, the FDA approval. And uh, let's see how things uh, shape up from here on. Right. So, so I think exciting space, you know, I mean, there's so many uh, cool things happening in the space of healthcare. And healthcare, I think now is being underpinned with uh AI also, I mean, you know, the AI is being leveraged in healthcare from drug discovery and so on and so forth. Uh, regenerative medicine. Can you explain the concept of regenerative medicine? Do also share some of your works in the field of uh, regenerative medicine. You said the, the vision of uh, regenerative medicine is to restore, replace uh, and recreate. And you, you mentioned also that uh, our body 
has healing mechanisms in it, but somehow that's not being leveraged at this point of time. That that's been happening in the animals, though. You know, the, the animal kingdoms. You know, there are various anim, animals from axolotl to lizards and so so on and so forth have a remarkable wound healing abilities. They also can regenerate limbs and organs, and and and, and there are various. Uh, I think. Uh, researchers, scientists who are working at the forefront to kind of see if that possibly maybe not now, maybe in the near future, we could possibly do that. that. Maybe uh, regrow limbs, regrow organs. Uh, could you elaborate more possibly on your works and also maybe works on your peers who are looking at the, these moonshots of uh, uh, leveraging regenerative medicine for healthcare? Sure. I mean, so I think you are striking the chords, which are the dreams of uh, regenerative medicine researchers. So, uh, I mean, of course, if this can be achieved, then nothing better than that, because that possibly is uh, the way when we don't have to think about uh, even uh, organ donations or, uh, or any other challenges associated. Um, and surely nature, as I said, provides answers to most of our problems as well. So you gave the examples of exaltals and then lizards growing their tails back. Sadly, um, not most of our organs can regenerate with that efficiency. However, we even our, in our body, we do have certain organs which regenerate pretty well, right? Uh, for example, the liver can regenerate very well. Uh, so even if you have one eighth portion of the liver, uh, then it can regenerate to the full uh, organ itself. Uh, whereas um, in our body, if you see many of the cells uh, and tissues, for example, the gastrointestinal tract, that continuously keeps on regenerating itself. However, as you can understand, different organs will have different capacities of regeneration. And there comes the picture of stem cells. So if you see, <clears throat> the entire body is getting created from uh, just one cell, the zygote, which uh, starts dividing and ultimately creates the entire human structure. However, when a cell starts dividing, it starts losing its capability to uh, keep on replicating on itself as well. So there's the I mean I keep teaching uh, stem cell biology and therapy here as well, and in our initial classes I discuss a few of the stories associated uh, with that. So uh, there was one very famous uh, American scientist, I think American, I'm not very sure, Alexis Carroll. So he's a Nobel Prize winner. So in the very early 1900s. So, uh, and he was so accomplished that it was very difficult for people to challenge him. So he thought that uh, he had an experiment where he showed that he can uh, keep the chicken heart cells alive for more than 20 years. And that too in those, uh, I think, 19, early 1900s, I don't remember the time. And nobody was able to challenge him. Sadly, uh, people tried to replicate that, but they were failing it. Um, he would just say that he would replace the nutrients and it keeps on, it remains alive. But uh, then came the scientist called Hayflick. So Hayflick was able to discover the phenomenon which is now known as the Hayflick's limit. So what happens is, as cells start keep on dividing and forming newer cells, the chromosomes that we have within those cells, within the nucleus, they keep on reducing in size with every new um, uh, cycle. And um, unless there have some enzymes like telomerases. Now telomerases are enzymes which are of importance in case of cancers. So what happens in there is that uh, the telomerase does not allow the shortening and hence uh, they can keep on uh, does not allow the shortening means to that extent that it happens in normal cells so but in normal cells of course the shortening happens once it reaches a critical value then it cannot continue to divide so in case of stem cells the this hayflix limit is relatively larger much larger uh, compared to other cells so we talk about two phenomena we talk about proliferation and we talk about differentiation. What does this mean? Proliferation means a cell can keep on dividing and forming new cells. And differentiation is when it is attaining special properties. And uh, so a stem cell by its inherent nature is very immature cell. Whereas it can give rise to 
a mature cell type which will have specialized functions. So the nerve cell will function as the nerve cell, the uh, osteoblast which is functioning as the bone cell and so on and so forth across the body. But once you are uh, having a differentiated cell, those cells usually are not able to divide. So now research of course is undergoing if we are able to find mechanisms where you can reverse it. And we, uh, that actually led to the discovery of iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells. So um, uh, Yamanaka and uh, his team, they uh, discovered it, uh, which won them the Nobel Prize as well. So uh, what they did is um, they were able to uh, identify only four factors, which if you are able to put inside the cell, you will be able to create, a, I mean, reprogram a cell. So from its differentiated form to a completely undifferentiated embryonic-like stem cell. But of course, uh, to establish this in uh, the way that you can actually use them for regeneration purposes uh, does meet with a lot of hurdles, uh, which includes one of the fact includes the uh, ethical concerns as well. Although we keep talking about it that iPSCs have relatively much less ethical concerns compared to embryonic stem cells, uh, yet still they do because uh, what is the concern? Let me just address that first. So when you are talking about embryonic stem cells, which are basically the cells after the initial few divisions of the zygote, and so these cells can form an entire human being. So if you want to use them for regeneration, you cannot. The reason being, then essentially you are uh, killing a human being which cannot be ever ethically agreed upon. So then came the concept of iPSCs where people said that you are anyway using a, um, a cell from the adult and you are reprogramming it back to an embryonic-like state. But sadly, the same problem still exists. So if you are reprogramming it to an embryonic-like cell, then you again are getting a cell which can produce the entire human organism. So the problem still stays back. However, now people have also come up with newer technologies, which are known as uh, nuclear reprogramming, altered nuclear reprogramming, where what they are trying to do is uh, the zygote, once it starts dividing, obviously after a few divisions, uh, it will start showing certain signs of differentiation. So those differentiated, relatively uh, differentiated cells, they cannot create an entire organism. So what people are trying to do is if you can jumpstart certain genes, uh, at the time of creating these uh, stem cells, then you can possibly use these cells for your regeneration purposes. Uh, and people have come up with certain uh, genes which they have looked at. For example, there's a gene called CD8, uh, CDX2. Then there's a gene called Nanog. So uh, of course, scientists are working a lot with these things uh, and trying to see if we can recreate organs or uh, entire parts of the body uh, with these systems. But of course, uh, there's still a lot, long way to go, I, I must confess. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I think it, it's so awesome that scientists around the world, such as yourself, are, are trying to push the boundaries of what we once termed impossible. Because, you know, yes, I mean, the, these, the horizon of, you know, possibly, you know, making it uh, from lab to clinic is, is going to take some time. But it seems possible. And I think if a collaborative push happens, then there's so many problems that we, we'll be able to solve uh, in, in the healthcare space. You know, in the stem cell space also, you know, I think there are some fantastic science, scientists who are taking a stem cell, turning into in, induced pluripotent stem cells and, and creating these uh, uh, brain organoids and stuff like that. And, and you know, to, to kind of research and, and you know, for, uh, uh, I mean, you know, creating drugs and so on and so forth. Now, uh, uh, it, the, the, the same problem of, of like, you know, clinic to lab. Now that that's like a major problem, you know, I mean, could, could you could you maybe talk about maybe some uh, real life examples or success stories of patients who've been benefited from regenerative uh, medicine treatments? Sure. Uh, let me just probably first uh, highlight the elephant in the room regarding the challenges. Why regenerative medicine is meeting with so many hurdles? So I was recently reading a, a report uh, by the Government Accountability Office uh, of the US. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's an FDA related, I'm not very sure. Uh, so they have very nicely actually summarized the problems, uh, which include standardization, 
uh, of these uh, methods uh, of regenerative medicine because as you can understand these are not conventional treatment protocols right so each one will have its own nuances and challenges associated so a formal um, standardization process is very difficult and uh, just like any drug or any medical device you cannot regulate these as well so how do you come up with newer regulations because obviously when it is going from the bench to the bedside you obviously want these things to be safe uh, so i'll give you one example of uh, another treatment uh, which was approved recent uh, a few years back uh, called zinteglo for beta thalassemia <clears throat> So Zinteglo was, uh, it's still probably under clinical trials in some parts, but I think in Europe they have stopped it. Uh, they actually uh, tried to do it for sickle cell anemia as well. So basically what they were trying to do is uh, similar to what I was referring to with the CRISPR-Cas technology, but they were not using CRISPR-Cas, they were using another technology. Uh, but what they were trying to do is take the stem cells out of the patient, re-engineer the cells uh, so that they can uh, produce the normal uh, type of hemoglobin and put them back. So it was uh, the initial clinical trials were and have shown good results, but I think uh, they started a trial with uh, sickle cell anemia as well patients, but they met up with a hurdle that the fact that uh, they got uh, a patient having uh, leukemia. So they had to stop the trials. Um, but I guess, uh, again, uh, they might be able to uh, cross those hurdles. And, and the third problem that uh, the government accountability office highlighted was regarding the manufacturing protocols. So how do you do a large scale manufacturing of things and how can you achieve that? <clears throat> so of course, these are major problems, but having said that coming to the next part of your question was uh, the success stories. Uh, so if you look at, uh, like I gave the example of Casgevy is a recent one which uh, is going to hit the, uh, I think the clinical trials uh, soon. Uh, then uh, you might have heard about uh, CAR T cells. So the chimeric antigen um, receptor and uh, T cells. So these are targeting um, actually the cancers. So here, what they are trying to do is uh, they are um, engineering the uh, T cells so that uh, they can recognize the uh, cancer cells and um, then you will be able to kill specifically the cancer cells. Uh, so as of now, I think uh, it started, I think the first one got approval in 2017. And uh, in 2022, uh, as of 2022, I think there are six uh, uh, already in clinical trials uh, underway. So CAR T cells are also showing good promise. Uh, then I think in 2022, they also were able to come up with a 3D printed bio um, ear, the uh, pinna, uh, so which was again transplanted. So that's again another success story. We have heard a lot about uh, the skin replacement uh, things, of course, may not be the fullest extent, but yes, people are at least uh, to a certain extent, they have got some success in that area. Uh, in case of uh, scaffold based technology for uh, uh, thalassemia, uh, sorry, um, I beg your pardon. In case of scaffold-based technologies for osteoarthritis and uh, diseases which require a platform, we have got good um, uh, examples. Then uh, recently people are also working on uh, retinal implants with that uh, regenerative technology. So people having diseases like macular degeneration, if you are able to uh, use stem cells and synthesize the stem cells and allow that patch to be recovered, that is being tried. Uh, then. Um, liver regeneration uh, anyways uh, transplantation anyways is, uh, is uh, established for a long time now and then uh, bone replacements so bone replacement in the sense like uh, where there is a defective piece of bone you get to remove it and then you can replace it with an implant or maybe you put that implant as a supportive technology and use it so there are many many technologies which are already in way um, underway with regenerative medicine Pancreatic cell, uh, cell organoids uh, are being worked upon. So yes, there are quite a few examples as of now. So I think uh, the sky is 
slowly starting to show good uh, light. <laughs> yeah. Lovely, lovely. Uh, we wish you the, the very best, doctor, because I think, you know, people such as yourself, scientists, researchers are like really pushing the forefront of what's what's kind of possible. You mentioned that your research work is in micro RNA, beta thalassemia, micro RNA, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis. Uh, what's the support system been for, uh, you know, people at the cutting edge of science such as yourself? What's the support system been and what would be your pitch to you know i mean creating more uh uh you know enabling empowering system so you know scientists researchers doctors at the forefront such as yourself can you know quickly take these uh from the lab to the market yeah i mean thanks thank you for bringing this up um, of course the support system uh, for us are mostly the government funds because Whenever you are researching in the areas which are niche areas, uh, you wouldn't expect uh, private players to jump onto it unless there is a proven uh, track record for things to work well. So most of our research is backed by government funding. Uh, so, uh, but of course uh, we do at times face hurdles as well because of uh, the time it takes for uh, the entire process to run through, for example, you first uh, prepare your proposal, then you submit it. Uh, but beyond the submission, the entire peer review process takes a long time. Uh, and in, at times it goes beyond a year or year and a half once it gets approved. Uh, or maybe it's even worse when after a year you get to realize that uh, the proposal was rejected by the reviewers. Even after approvals, uh, it may take time for you to get the funds um, so it, it it becomes challenging in such situations, but uh, nevertheless, uh, whatever kind of work we are able to do is primarily by the government support system that we have. Um, there are some private players who are uh, probably uh, looking at the kind of work uh, which may be showing certain glimpses of uh, maybe coming uh, to fruition in the next uh, few years, then they might be interested. But uh, mostly speaking, in the regenerative medicine field is primarily uh, the, the government sector, especially for the academic uh, world, I'm saying. And of course, there are private players in the industry, for example, uh, the biotechnology industry, they are doing a lot of their own research, which I will not possibly be able to comment much upon. But yes, uh, uh, what I probably think about the challenges in terms of the work that we are doing will include uh, that uh, maybe it would be very nice if there is a PPP model, the uh, public-private partnership model somehow can be created uh, more efficiently. There are certain models, I agree, uh, but I think we need more of them. So we have uh, the corporate social responsibility funds which need to be utilized more efficiently. Uh, most of the times uh, we see even constraints uh, with those funds as well. So if these, those such funding can also be utilized for uh, uh, scientific research uh, in different fields, uh, that would add on to, I mean, that will kind of relax the government uh, funding as well to an extent and also help researchers who are always uh, constrained with the funds. Uh, one of the major problems uh, with uh, which we are witnessing nowadays is, uh, you know, I mean, as uh, scientists, you would obviously want to showcase the kind of work that you are doing and which is primarily through journal publications that we are doing. Unfortunately, uh, there is a recent movement uh, towards, uh, uh, towards something called open access publications. So uh, why I say unfortunate uh, is not because I am against open access publications. So please do not get me wrong. Uh, open access is, literally means that it should be accessible to everyone. And this is definitely a very good idea, but very badly implemented to be very honest. Uh, the reason being uh, that what I'll just probably give you the idea how it conventionally used to work. So if you look at, uh, if you want to read any particular journal article, you would have to uh, reach out to the, uh, the publication house. And most of the times these are subscription based. So, and subscription charges are very high. So uh, it is usually through the institutional libraries that you get access to these um, articles. But of course, you will not be able to get access to all the articles because uh, they will have to reach out to all publishers and the institute has to fund uh, uh, pay money to all the publishers. So there are certain restrictions. So people thought that this will be an open access publication will be a good option so that 
everybody will get the access to the articles free. But then publishing houses are not uh, not not for profit organizations. They are working for profit. So what they did is if uh, they need to do it, so who goes who is going to pay for it? Then they levy the charges on the authors. And uh, you will be literally shocked to know the level of uh, charges that uh, people are coming up with. Certain uh, journals, like the really big journals in nature publishing houses, uh, uh, like I think there's Nature Neuroscience or something, which for one article to publish, you will require more than $11,000, wow. which is exorbitant and which probably is inculcating a new type of neocolonialism, according to me. So there have been a lot of movements uh, related to open access publications and moving towards open access publications. But I think uh, for uh, researchers from countries like ours, we are uh, paying heavily for that. Because if you look at uh, the uh, WHO's uh, uh, income classification of the countries, we are not falling in the high income category. But sadly, if you go to the journal websites, they are not classifying as, as a low income or uh, middle income and uh, they will be leaving almost the same charges for most of the journals, like in the Western countries. So uh, this skews the uh, balance uh, a lot and very heavily, essentially. And with this, uh, there was a recent movement uh, and it's still a movement, it's known as the planners, which the European um, um, funding agencies and European academies and I think the US as well is a part of it. Uh, so they have come up with a consortium where they have made it decision that they will gradually move all towards open access uh, publications. So eventually all journals will move towards fully open access publications. So how do researchers from countries like, uh, which is, I don't want to, I don't like to use this term global south, but that's what uh, usually is being used. So I will just say that uh, how will people from the global south get access to publishing in the good journals when they all become fully open access. So that's not the right way of going ahead with things and uh, the road ahead, I don't know how we can think of uh, it, but I think uh, our government has taken a good decision recently with this uh, concept of one nation, one subscription. Uh, so that entire nation will have a one particular subscription rather than each institute having its own subscription. Obviously, there are, I think, a lot of negotiations going in the background with different publication houses. Uh, let's see how things shape up with that. Right. Yeah, I hope that they take a stance which is, you know, which is en enabling and empowering rather than this approach that they take. It. So my la last question to you, Doctor, uh, uh, can you... Uh, paint a picture of what the world is going to look like in the next five or 10 years with the regenerative medicine and also possibly your moonshot. So I think the future is really bright. Um, and I think uh, we will see a lot of amalgamation of the different uh, disciplines of science uh, with the AI coming in a big way uh, with the recent times. Uh, we will possibly see a lot of, uh, well, to be honest, sky is the limit, but then in the next five or 10 years, I think we will slowly see how AI will eventually culminate uh, with biology or join with biology in a big way. Uh, I am sure recently you might have heard about uh, the Neuralink chip, um, which uh, has uh, already been, uh, they have started a trial on humans as well. So uh, we are not very clear as to how things are going to shape up in the next uh, five years, but the way things are moving ahead uh, very fast, uh, we possibly will have a lot of breakthroughs in the field of regenerative medicine, uh, where people will possibly be able to get certain uh, diseases uh, which were not curable. Uh, we can probably use uh, technology to replace those or, uh, organs or um, systems. So personal moonshot, obviously, uh, we are working a lot in the field of beta thalassemia. So obviously, CRISPR-Cas technology uh, is something that uh, has uh, they have started working on, but we are also working on multiple uh, avenues uh, with beta thalassemia. So we hope to get a breakthrough with our research as well. And uh, maybe if it can be translated uh, to the world that will be wonderful for us.
Doctor, really, really appreciate you taking time, being part of the podcast. It was such an enlightening conversation. You broke down everything, simplified things, which is was very difficult to understand. I'm sure my audience is going to learn quite a lot. I got to learn quite a lot from this. You know, I think we're sitting a fantastic point of time. You said, you know, we there's all these technology tech stack is converging. You know, where AI is converging with the po uh, possibly uh, biotech, and and you know, AI is going to help with drug discovery. And you also mentioned about neural neural links breakthrough with brain computer interface so i think you know we're sitting in such a fantastic point of time i think just possibly uh, maybe two weeks back there was this breakthrough of this 11 year boy deaf boy who could who, 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 was, who was able to you know hear properly up because of the genetic uh, 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 uh therapy treatment though these are very very expensive but i hope that kind of tickles down and it, it goes down and touches everyone, everyone's life, you know, because there's millions of people around the world who are suffering and they need this, you know, through the regenerative medicine, maybe possibly organ transplantation. Uh, uh, and, and your word you said, you know, restore, replace, recreate. I hope we get into the future. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. My listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. And until next time, see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Really appreciate this. Thank you. Thanks a lot.